bhavatu sahana upnatu sahaviryam karavavai All the dignitaries gathered here and friends. As you all know, Mahatma Gandhi's life and message dominantly reflect two important ideas. One is Satya, another is Ahimsa. It's all very obvious to all of us. Satya represents the moral integrity, morality as a whole. Without the basic truthfulness, Satya, morality cannot be practiced of its various dimensions. And Ahimsa, non-violence, mainly represents, basically represents the humanity, human consider consideration. These are the most important points. One is the moral integrity, morality and humanity. And as you all know, Mahatma Gandhi was also deeply spiritual though he was involved in politics. So spirituality also considers one of the important component of his life. These are the most essential aspects of religion as you all know. One is spirituality, another is morality, another is humanity. And Spirituality constitutes the, the basic foundation of religion. Without spirituality, morality also cannot sustain. And without spirituality and morality, the humanity also cannot sustain. So these are the most important. If you have hold on to these three most important aspects of religion, and there is no doubt human, uh, human, uh, religious harmony is assured. There are other aspects of religion. Is there. there are temples are there, rituals are there, different modes of worship are there, books are there, so many festiv festivals are there, so many things are there, rituals are there, so many things, many, many things are there. As Swami Vivekananda says, these are all the secondary details of religion. Religion is realization, the spirituality. Religion is the manifestation of divinity, as Swami Vivekananda puts it. The spiritual aspect must be emphasized. When you are able to emphasize the spiritual aspect, there will be completely, without any doubt, religious harmony can be assured. Let's see basic. If that spirituality is completely lost, and morality also cannot sustain. If you take up an example to illustrate this one, a tree is there. Tree consists of the, and the roots also, and a trunk also, and also flowers and fruits and all that. And around that tree, huge tree, there would be so many thorny bushes would be there, creepers would be there, so many th other things would be there. So religion constitutes the, the root of the, the religious tree, root of the religious tree. And the trunk and other branches constitute the morality of the religious tree. And fruits and flowers constitute the humanity Without that humanity, humanitarian consideration, religions 
prison has no value at all. So this is the important. And other things are there, you know, all the, with the creepers and the thorny bushes and so many other things are there. They constitute the secondary details of religion. What we make mistake, you know, we give so much of importance to secondary details of religion. That becomes the important aspect of religion. You hold on to that so doggedly. And because of that so much of communal disharmony takes place. What is important is you have to hold on to the spiritual aspect of the world and morality aspect of it. If you take out Sri Ramakrishna's example, you know, Sri Ramakrishna practiced all the different religions, all the different sects of the Hinduism and different religions also he practiced. And after practicing all these different denominations, then he come to the conclusion that all the religious, all the religions, all the different denominations of religions, all the practices of religion will lead to the one and the same goal, that is ultimate reality God. What is important is Vakulata, he says, Vakulata, yearning for God. The spiritual aspiration, deep spiritual aspiration is most important. When that is there, then everything is okay. Everybody can reach that ultimate goal. So this is from Sri Ramakrishna's idea. Sri Ramakrishna was like, you know, most ambitious mountaineer. The mountain is there. Claiming the mountain in one direction, he reaches the zenith of the mountain, peak of the mountain. And he is not satisfied with that. He wants to climb the mountain in other directions also, some other directions also, in the difficult path also. He wants to climb that mountain. And you know, in the bottom level, there will be so much of differences should be there. In the, uh, as far as the path towards the summit of the mountain is concerned. When person reaches the closer, closer to the summit, then what happens, you know, everybody will closer and closer and closer. And after reaching the summit, everybody becomes one. That is oneness. This oneness is most important. Every path, every path of every religious path, every spiritual path, according to Sri Ramakrishna, is the path towards that ultimate reality. So we have to have that spiritual aspiration. When you have that spiritual aspiration and moral considerations, etc., and humanitarian consideration, etc., then only you will be able to attain the peace and harmony among the religion. Sri Swami Vivekananda is, you know, used to say, so much of good is also done in, from through religion. So much of humanitarian activities are done. Any service activities you, you see, it is always somehow or the other related to some religious personality. And at the same time, in the name of religion, so much of bloodshed also is done. So much of violence also is done. In the name of religion, in the name of compassionate God. It's still going on also. Unless we hold on to the spirituality and it is an essential aspect of this spiritual life, our religious life, that is spirituality, morality and humanity, these communal violences cannot be stopped. Because we are more interested in the peripheral aspect of the religion only. The secondary details of the religion only. In secondary details, you know, there will be differences is very obvious, it cannot be avoided at all. So because of the differences, you know, then naturally there will be conflict today. So that is why most important aspect of religion we have to hold on to. And if you are able to hold on to that one and pursue our spiritual life, giving more importance to the spiritual insights, spiritual practices, spiritual evolution, then naturally morality will get strengthened. Normally what I was saying, I, I give the example of the tree. We neglect the, the root of the tree. 
we don't manure it properly, we don't water it properly, then what happens, you know, the tree will collapse. The morality also cannot stand. If morality also goes, the trunk also get weakened, then humanity also will suffer. <laughs> so that is what happens. If you neglect spirituality in religion, the morality also cannot sustain. If the morality is not there, of course, you know, the result of it. So there will be so much of violence and conflict, etc. So that is why we have to hold on to spirituality. So Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda and all other great personalities, Mahatma Gandhi, all great personalities are holding on to this spirituality. Even though Mahatma Gandhi was deeply involved in politics, he was deeply spiritual. So that is the message of Mahatma Gandhi. We have to hold on to the spirituality. With the help of the spirituality, with firmly standing on spirituality, then only we can involve ourselves in different kinds of activities related to the different aspects of the human life. So, I am very happy to be here participating in this August Assembly and speaking few words on the peace and harmony related to the different religions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji, for enlightening us on the significance of spirituality, morality, and humanitarian aspects of religion, citing examples from lives of Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Archbishop Most Reverend Felix Machado of Vasai. He is a distinguished leader within the Catholic Church his leadership extends beyond the church as he actively engages in community service, interfaith dialogue and social development initiatives. His contributions to both the church and the broader community reflect his dedication to promoting peace, understanding and to charitable work. Archbishop Machado served as undersecretary at the political Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue at the Vatican. He has been the Archbishop of Vasai since December 2009. In July 2020, he was appointed a member of the Pontifical Society for Interreligious Dialogue by Pope Francis. Vasai na Archbishop Parmapurja Felix Machado Avaru, Catholic Church in a Pratishtita Naika Ivaru Church Allade Samudaya Seve Antar Dharma Samvada Matu Samajika Abhivridhiali Sakrivagi Netritva Vaisidare. I request uh, Reverend Sir to kindly come and deliver his lecture. Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, I would like to, at the very beginning, lest I forget, express my gratitude for the Mahatma Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, Udayji, Yush Kumarji, your team, all your uh, collaborators, but I would especially, since yesterday, I observed the active part that the young people here have taken. I would like to take another as a compliment to what Swamiji was saying, the essence of religion. I move into how religions need to come together because the fact is unless there is peace among religions the world will never see peace. This is a fact. I don't want to go into details but speak about interreligious dialogue. Interreligious dialogue is basically a network of interpersonal relationships. 
dialogue is heavily loaded Greek word. It talks of philosophy, so therefore I like to use the word relationships. One must learn to relate to the other with respect and esteem for the dignity of the other. Through dialogue, through these relationships, one can enter into the very depth of the lives of people who profess and adhere to their respective religious traditions. Interreligious dialogue is not intended to enter into polemics and debates between religions. It is not even meant to change the essential teachings of religions. It is not a question of cerebral discussion across the table. It is not even negotiations between persons in order to strike the least common denominator. The art of listening intensively to the other plays an important role in interreligious relations. When conflicts, disagreements or disputes arise among believers of religions, and Swamiji said, as much as good there is, there is also worst that religions are accused of. And so therefore, when such conflicts arise, dialogue remains the only alternative. But dialogue will achieve very little if it has not been initiated during good times, peaceful times. Don't be self-complacent, thinking that, oh, we are, India is very interreligious, we are all brothers, sisters here. No, I think we should never be complacent. But what one can do when these good times are there, peaceful times are there, we have to initiate interreligious dialogue, live in relationships, good relationships of respect and esteem. Because interreligious dialogue is not a fire brigade or an ambulance that you can call when there is an emergency. Too late. I have gone through this in 2006 in Mumbai sleepless nights, because I have seen outside the seminary where I was formator of young minds who are trying to become Catholic priests. The whole of Mumbai was in flames, literally. And so, that is the time when I was called, where is your interreligious dialogue? I said, it is not an ambulance. We should have been taking care before. And so, cultivating friendly and fraternal relations during good and peaceful times is the best practice. Interreligious dialogue concerns all of us, all of us, of every religion. Nobody should be excluded, no one should be left behind. A vast field lies open for us to do dialogue. Because sometimes my own friends tell me, you know, you are a little bit more studied, so you can do this. No, I said, everyone can play an important role. Because there are different forms and expressions in service of peace, justice, fraternity, and sustainable development. There is the so-called dialogue of life through which between different religions, the believers bear gentle and non-imposing witness to their own human and spiritual values before each other in daily life and help each other concretely to build a more just and fraternal society. There can also be an exchange between experts of their respective religions. Two people, me, let us say from Christianity, Swamiji, 
from Swami Vivekananda to Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. I would, we would, we would need to meet, and we do, on different uh, occasions, to kind of discuss, you know, what do we mean by this? What is the real meaning? How should we live? Swamiji was very well giving that in short speech. He gave us the essence. Then there is dialogue of cooperation for integral development of every human person and all people. This is much needed. This dialogue can be done by so many of us. And safeguarding religious values and patrimony of all, which can be put at the service of caring for our planet. I, Pope Francis calls it our home thereby achieving integral development of each person and all people. There is also dialogue in which believers of different religions share their deeper spiritual experiences and enrich the religious patrimony, for example, of our Mother India. Mahatma Gandhi may not have done a formal interreligious dialogue, but nonetheless, for me, even though I am a post-independent child of India, Mother India, but Mahatma Gandhi has sustained me till today in much of my spiritual life. The theme of peace is central to all religions. This is why Mahatma Gandhi undertook the task of making every effort to make humanity one family of God in which all people live in harmony and peace. This is not utopia for me. I have seen over the years, I myself have grown in my relationships. We know I call her Akta. She is younger than me. But she is my Akta. In public I have called her Akta. Sudin Kulkarni this morning, he is my brother, not only a friend. And I mean this, we live like that. We share when difficult moments come and go ahead, not for ourselves, but for all of us, for the whole world. And so one family of God, this is what Mahatma Gandhi wished. He saw the theme of peace in a wider context of the problems in the world. For example, the dehumanizing poverty. He was moved, he was compassionate. Exploitation of weaker society, weaker people in society, like children, women, especially those who are victims of war, of broken families, and of abuse. There is ecological disaster, discrimination on the basis of caste and religious affinity oppression of minorities, problems related to disillusioned youth, unequal distribution of the world's resources, and one can go on and on and on. Mahatma Gandhi, I would like, I would like to come to the theme that is given to me. What has it got to do with 21st century? I loved all the sessions since, since yesterday since the inauguration of the program. I particularly liked also this previous session we had because, yes, what is Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi's, what is Mahatma Gandhi's relevance to, not only today, but future? Mahatma Gandhi always dreamt of peace in the hearts of people, peace among people, and peace for our country so that it can be light to the nations. Yes, we want to become Vishwa Guru, but let's not be pretentious. Others must call us Vishwa Guru. We cannot impose them ourselves as Vishwa Gurus. And so Gandhiji was not a wishful thinker, but his feet were grounded in the grassroots of reality. Mahatma Gandhi left a legacy of peace for the future generations because peace is not built in one instant, but everyone is challenged to keep on building it. 
and without abandoning it in the face of difficulties, always beginning anew. Dear sisters and brothers, the progress of the nation, any nation in the world, cannot be measured by the number of nuclear weapons it has in stockpiles. The real criteria of success are to be seen in the miserable and destitute who are still above the poverty, below poverty line. We, we see increasing literacy among all sections of society, but eradicating child marriages and reducing child deaths, stopping completely the starvation deaths, improving the condition of women, constantly making our democracy strong and robust. This is how we will find out the health and success of our nation, Mother India. Indian constitutional setup has withstood the complications that an independent democratic society with diverse castes, linguistic groups and religious communities faces. This is thanks to the Mahatma. He taught me saying that religion cannot be separated from politics and politics cannot be separated from religion. Because if anyone who does that knows neither religion nor politics. So India succeeded, unlike its neighbors for example, in bringing substantial democracy, democracy to its polity as opposed to other nations where only procedural democracy was established. Indian society has faithfully imbibed the democratic spirit of its constitutional order. Independent India has built successful, robust welfare delivery mechanisms such as the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee, a scheme and the public distribution system constituted affirmative action program to overcome historic, historical inequalities of the caste system of the Indian subcontinent succeeded in the partial devolution of governance to local institutions such as the Panchayat Raj systems given economic freedom to the masses with free trade. I come from a little place, Vasai, where cooperatives are the biggest strength of our people, in which all religions, people of all religions are involved, of all castes, of all uh, color and language are involved. Obviously, as I end, I must say, new challenges await India. For example, widening economic inequality, religious caste-based identity, polarization, corruption, and subsequent apathy among the youth towards our democratic values. And there are many other things. Mahatmaji can still inspire peace. He is an inspiration for me. He did in his time what was needed to be done. He said what was to be said. Where am I? What am I saying? What am I doing? That is the self-examination I have. Harmony and parity will come if we reframe our national ethos to replace the culture of silence with a culture of transparency. The culture of hatred and discrimination with the culture of dialogue and respect. The culture of violence with the culture of peace and the culture of ex exclusion with the culture of inclusion of those who have been still left behind. Even the 21st century 
In this century, peace in the world has been threatened by the same old forces which generate conflicts and wars. Sadly, India is not exempt from these. Among these forces are intolerance and marginalization of all kinds. Social mar marginalization, cultural, political as well as religious. Day by day, fresh violence is inf inflict inflicted upon individuals and even peoples and the cultures of death spread by unjust unjustifiable resource to violence to re resolve tensions. While it, is not, while it is an innovation to be welcomed, we cannot ignore the potential danger of artificial intelligence which can deteriorate the situation still further. Mark my words, I don't want to enter any controversy. I fully agree with the speakers of the previous session and the applause that the audience gave. Artificial intelligence is a welcome thing that we need. We need. But we cannot ignore the potential dangers, such as even as internet. We have said enough on this quoting Mahatma Ji, that he, Mahatma Gandhi, was for science, was for technology, but not for the abuse of science and technology. And what I said is uh, quoted by M. K. Narayanan, who was former director of intelligence bureau and former national security advisor and former governor of West Bengal. This is what I quote him. Awareness of the growing danger of digital threats is but the first step, awareness is the first step in the battle of cyber and artificial intelligence directed threats. There is hence every need to counter digital surveillance, disillusionment, bullying and manipulation for our survival. Given the appalling situation of wars and conflict in so many parts of the world, the memory of Mahatma Gandhi stands as light and guiding star who deeply involved in international and inter-religious efforts to bring about peace, justice and reconciliation. Before World War II, he made a, wherever he could, he made efforts. He even came to Rome, saw Mussolini. He wanted to see the Pope. Unfortunately, for reasons that I know, could not be seen. He could not meet the Holy Father because Gandhiji had come from round table conference in London on his way to take the ship from Genoa, Italy to go to India. He had only one day and in one day, unannounced, he appears, but he never felt bitter or sad what happened. But my point is this, he wanted to see every political leader he wanted to see every religious leader and convince them that the path the West was taking, path of weapons and war, should not, should, will not be only destroying the people of that time, but it will be a precedence for world to kindly, uh, to kind of go on the path of violence. He wanted to stop that, and that is why I say that he is a guiding star, he is the light. He continued to insist on the negotiated and non-military resolution of conflicts and looked for the day when nations will abandon war as a way of vindicating claims, as a means of resolving differences. Mahatma Gandhi was convinced that war creates more problems than it ever resolves, that dialogue is the only just and noble path to mutual agreement and reconciliation and the patient and wise art of peacemaking is especially blessed by God Almighty. And I end by this. To achieve this, 
we must never lose sight of the human person. <coughs> the human person, the people are the center of everyone. Politician, politicians, religious leaders, everybody. The person who must be the center of every social project. This is the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi who proposed the path of building a world community based on mutual trust, mutual support and sincere mutual respect. Jai Hind, Jai Jagat. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Father, for sharing with us the importance of interreligious dialogue, especially at times of peace, to ensure relationship is strengthened in daily lives and relating to Mahatma Gandhi from his own life experiences. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kezivino Aram. She is the president of Shanti Ashram, Coimbatore, and is a co-moderator of Religions for Peace. With a deep commitment to fostering interfaith dialogue and social justice, Dr. Aram has been instrumental in advancing the mission of Shanti Ashram, an organization dedicated to empowering marginalized communities and promoting peace. Her leadership in this role is focused on addressing the needs of the underserved and facilitating transformative social change. In her capacity as co-moderator for Religions for Peace, Dr. Aram collaborates with diverse religious and spiritual leaders from around the globe. Together, they work to tackle pressing global issues and build bridges of understanding among different faiths. Dr. Kesivino Aram Avaru, Koyambaturina Gandhi Ashramada Kirshanaditare. Ivaru, Religions for Peace in Vasamste, Saha Moderator Agitu, Prapanchada Dhyanta, Vivida Dharmika, Matu Adhyatmika Naikarundige, Samvada Nadesalo, Sahaskari Suttare. I now request Dr. Aram to address the gathering. I've been sitting since morning, witness to the leaders of the next generation. Please join me in acknowledging Pavan and Ashutosh who are here. And Pavan and Ashutosh, thank you. Thank you for being the witness. And Dr. Kulkarni, thank you for being their mentor. Uh, I was so moved to hear that you're mentoring children in, in this particular world. You can, you can clap your hands loudly for the next generation. You know why I say this? Because it reminded me of my childhood in Nagaland. When I was being introduced as Kezavino Aram, Kezavino is a Naga name, a name that my parents gave me in the midst of their work in the Nagaland peace movement. And there, many, many times, it was not sitting in the table hearing what was happening, but it was being in the vicinity of some wonderful leaders that the Gandhian movement gave this country. J. Prakash Narayan, Virobha Bhave, Shobhana Tai, so many people were there and there was always the place for a child. So will you again please clap your hands and bless Pavan and Ashita. They are absorbing what we are doing and they will carry forward not just what we say, but they will carry forward, I'm sure, what we do, what we aspire for, this wonderful nation. I'm very grateful, Dr. Krishna, to you and the Karnataka Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, to you, Rai Sahab, and the wonderful team at the National Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, but to Anna Malayana, I don't know where Anna is sitting, Anna Malayana, for bringing me back for this gathering of the Sarvodhya Gandhi and family. Big round of applause again. It's, 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 I think these are moments where celebrations mark coming together. Celebrations creates the time and the space to listen to one another. And therefore, I have only three points to add to what Swamiji, Your Grace, you have added. One is from Swami Vivekananda's thought 
of how the underlying spirituality that religion provides humanity can be developed. And without that, there will be no order in this society. And when there is no order, violence can prey on these structures that are often unequal. Your Grace, you also spoke to us so beautifully about that generation that was born after independence. In fact, Mr. Sharma, you said, I don't belong to the generation of freedom fighters. I think of myself always as to where do I belong in this Sarvodhya Gandhian family. I don't belong to the generation like you that won independence. I don't belong, Your Grace, to the generation that was born before independence. But I belong to that group of people who are proud to call themselves Indians, who want peace for every brother and sister in this society. Sarva Udaya, the progress of every man and woman as one's own. This is where I want to look around a little bit. Mr. Sam Petroda did that. Professor Kulkarni did that in the morning. I want to look around three or four pieces of statistics that will tell you why our meeting, Dr. Krishna, is so important. This year, 2024, the highest and the greatest number of children around the world after World War II are experiencing violence. Violence in the form of hunger, violence in the form of displacement because of conflicts, violence in the way of being separated from their natural settings of being cared for by their families, violence in the form of poverty. And we know, Your Grace, child poverty is very different from adult poverty. The scars of child poverty are irreversible. University after university, whether it is in India, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, or Stanford, or Oxford, or Harvard, Dr. Krishna, they tell us if a child lives in poverty, the dissonance in the brain continues through life. So there is an incapacitation that happens in childhood that leaves them scarred for their adult life. And therefore, this one piece of statistics compounded by three little other pieces of statistics that I may bring to your attention. Highest number of conflicts in the world after World War II has been recorded in 2024. The greatest number of national elections going on in 2024. It means our leaders are preoccupied. They have to come back to power. And so some of these devastating problems may not have their attention. I say this data and this statistic only to remind you how precious this gathering is of coming together, listening together, and resolving Mr. Sharma to do more of what we can do ourselves, but also together. And therefore, I go back to Nagaland that, remind, that reminded me of looking at power and Ashutosh in a little closer way. I was a young girl growing up there. And in the Nagaland Peace Center, Mr. Menon is here. In the Nagaland Peace Center, just like in Gandhi Bhavan, they had meetings after meetings after meetings as to how people can come together, how the different tribes of Nagaland would come together to decide your grace, not to take it for granted, but to decide whether they were part of India. What was the method that the Gandhian movement chose? Nabukrishna Chaudhary, the first chief minister of Orissa, Marjorie Sykes, who worked with Mahatma Gandhi on basic education and translated the work of Tagore. Or Michael Scott, who, did, who represented the Quaker movement from England. They all decided the only way to do it was to respect one another's opinions and to meet and meet and meet till a resolution came. Just like Gandhi Bhavan is next to the seat of power, the Nagaland Peace Center had a hotline to the Prime Minister's office and a hotline to the heart of the Chief Minister of Nagaland. After 20 long years of hard work, Swamiji, after 20 long years of hard work, the Nagaland Peace Accord was signed. Still the lasting peace accord that the Naga people recognize as their own. And you can give them a big round of applause because it was not it did not come out of more violence. It came out of repeated, repeated conversations and mutual respect. 
But I saw one more thing. Anna Malayana has an exhibition downstairs. And you will see the work of the Gandhi movement in Nagaland. And I always proudly carry my Naga name. It means peace be with you. Keze means peace be with you. I carry that because as a young girl like Pawan and Ashutosh, I saw that peace can be won. And peace can be won non-violently. Not to be read only in the books, but to be seen. Many years later, Rahi Sahib, I had the honor of being the chief consultant on behalf of the UN to do the Human Development Report, the first ever Human Development Report for Nagaland. And when I was asked to find a thread for it, I said, peace building will be the main focus of this Human Development Report that looks at the Human Development Index that Professor Amartya Sen and Mahbubul Haq said. But I will not forget again the moment when I was in the Nagaland Assembly. I was not introduced as a Harvard graduate. I was not introduced, Dr. Kulkarni, as a doctor and a public health expert. I was not introduced even as the chief editor of the Human Development Report. You know how I was introduced? I was introduced as a second generation peacemaker. Because I was writing the story of the people. I hope together, when we meet, we remember the legacy continues in each one of us. And therefore, as Swamiji says, that humanity will only be realized or lived or believed in if we see ourselves as part of the tradition. In Professor Kulkarni's session, we said Gandhiji was open. He would, he would praise when praise was required, and he would reprimand when reprimand was required. Let that be the culture that we have. And therefore, I echo the gratitude of Swamiji and of Archbishop Machado to you, Dr. Krishna, that half this audience are young people. They will know, like we knew as young people, that peace is possible. And that dialogue that uh, uh, Archbishop Machado spoke about, the different ways we can dialogue, the dialogue of the mind, the dialogue of life, the dialogue of working together. I just want to do three examples that I often remind young people are gifts of Mahatma Gandhi and his generation in finding not just metaphors, but finding very simple symbols of interreligious harmony. The Sarva Dharma Prathana. The interreligious prayer was in many ways a research, a finding, a discovery of Mahatma Gandhi's generation. That when people of faith come together, Swamiji, when faith is central to their life, can we, in respect, in accord, pray besides each other? To every young person here, I know 25,000 of you are there in the different campuses. May you remember, this is a symbolic representation, but a meaningful testimony every day that India is home to the greatest number of religions in the world. Not only that, it is a living testimony that religions can coexist in peace. To every young person, that is the badge of honor that you want to take. Not to be told you don't have a place here, but to be told we all call it our home. The other beautiful symbol of the Sarvodhya Gandhian family, Anna Malayana, I know Sendil Anna is somewhere here, is something that required no degrees, but it required a tremendous search within your heart, which is Shramadan. I have seen leaders after leaders together cleaning their premises. At Shanti Ashram, I must say one of my favorite moments, Dr. Krishna, is every Friday with my staff to clean for 30 minutes together, our campus, where about 100,000 children come every year. This Ramadan was deeply understood by Mahatma Gandhi that in an unequal society, in a stratified society, by gender and by caste, something had to bring us together. And we do it every time. We do it every time because boundaries break, humility augments, and that little ego that comes up is always told everybody has to be part of the story. This is the second example from the Sarvodhya Gandhi family. If this is one thing that we can bring back it will bring intergenerational dialogue in a very different way. We don't have to be scanning. 
we don't have to be spinning. We will actually be building bridges between hearts because a young child will see we can go and talk when there are informal moments together. And the third thing, Your Grace, that I'm very fond of in the Sarvodhya Gandhian family is this sense of mentoring and care. When my mother, as a young mother, had two children within a gap of three years in Nagaland, Shobhana Tai, who was part, Anamlena, you shared the news of her passing away. Shobhana Tai was in Dig Boy at that time. Her husband was part of the petroleum industry. She came and she said, come along, come along, Minoti, come and rest in my house. I saw that in my mother's generation. They would ask people to come and rest in their homes. The homes need not be big. Today, today, I see 99-year-old Krishna Malamma in Gandhi Gram, Krishna Mal Jagannathan, saying, Vinu, come when you feel your head and your heart is walking too fast. May all Gandhian organizations, including this wonderful Gandhi Smarik Nidhi in Karnataka, be that safe space where we can experience what Subramanya Bharati, the famous poet from Tamil Nadu, said, Periya Kudumbam, the Vasudeva Kudumbakam that we speak. The Gandhian movement lived it. There are three very simple things that I have said. Standing beside each other in prayer, finding 30 to 40 minutes a week, not every day, a week, to clear the place that you do. The old forms of discrimination still exist. Caste, gender, or else why would we see rape going on like this? Why else will we see the poor being invisible in great and big moments? Not just being called Vishwaguru, but when big leaders come, pushing our poor to the periphery. But there are new forms, Dr. Krishna, Rahi Sahab of discrimination. Exclusion is valued more than inclusion. There are new forms. Where you study, what you drive, who you work with, which language you speak. In all this, this eternal example of Gandhiji, Yes. So what I want to present to you, just as two closing thoughts, is that peace in all its dimensions is something that the Gandhian movement can give to the world. Personal peace, Swamiji, that you spoke about, which is inseparable from the moral compass, the ethos, the ethics of a person, but also the bigger picture that Gandhiji spoke about. Beautifully he said, and I read it in my father's book, The Apostle of Peace, Gandhiji says, if one person rises spiritually, the entire society stands to gain. And if one person falls, society must believe they are falling with him or her. That imminent, that deep sense of connectivity is what technology can re-energize in a deeper way. We don't have to be afraid of technology. Good news can spread, good things can spread. But to all young people, I want to say one more thing that Gandhiji said. And it is in, the, in my office, I have it in front of me in the health center, in the children's health center that we have the international center. What you do today will determine your tomorrow. That was the magic of Mahatma Gandhi. That was the magic of his generation. Every leader that I met along in my father's generation were preoccupied by bringing their talent into fruition for the well-being of people, Your Grace, as you said. Let's do something. They were never analyzing. They analyzed to do something. Rai Sahab, that's something that I hope we can give our younger people. At a time when universities in India, Your Grace, Professor Kulkarni, Dr. Krishna, I'm so happy they're giving time to young people from in Maharashtra. One month in a year, they're going back for field work. I know, Dr. Krishna, in your institution, how you bring children into NSS. Let Gandhian institutions be that societal laboratory where they can come back and study and do more. That bias of Gandhiji's generation, of the Sarvodhya Gandhian family, not to gaze at a problem, but to understand it, own it, and solve it together. May that be our closing thought. When you walk across from Annamalayana's National Museum, there is the Raj Ghat. May every Indian, young or old, doesn't matter, man or woman doesn't matter, whether you speak Bengali or Hindi, it shouldn't matter. When they walk in, let them look to the right Annamalayana, where the talisman is written. 
may we make it our own, may we make it our own, that every time we do something, every time we do something, we recall the face of the last and the least. That's the talisman. But the words after moves me even more. It was a personal calling to every Indian. In fact, to every citizen of the world. He says, think whether what you are going to do will change the life of the last and the least a little better. Will it ease their life a little better? So on this wonderful day when we are celebrating 75 years of the Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, which had illustrious leaders, beginning with the President of India and the Prime Minister, and the legacy of illustrious leaders now in front of us who have taken the time to bring us together as a family. May we always remember this talisman begins with us, that each of us who are empowered with love, with knowledge, with leadership, with the power to serve, may we always ask us, is this something that will make our society better? And in the words of D.K. Pattamal, a language that my father called his own Tamil, but I learned Tamil only as 11, 12 year old. Vinobaji made a request to my parents since my mother was Bengali. She came from the Gandhian movement mentored by Marjorie Sykes and my father was Tamil. Vinobaji called my mother and said, Minoti, Aram, you have to speak a common language so that you can work and serve anywhere in India. Please teach the children Hindi and they will learn their father's and their mother's language because they have loving grandparents. <laughs> this also was an expression of the leaders of that time creating practical skills to do. But when I came back with to, to Tamil Nadu, I discovered Bharati, I discovered Carnatic music as well. And the song that resonated on All India Radio when Gandhiji took his last breath is the song, the two lines from the song that I want to leave you with to the younger people and to the wonderful leaders in the first three, four rows. May we always remember that cry for peace, that call for peace and active peace building that can only truly be built if we speak. I don't even use the word dialogue. We speak to one another. We listen, as Archbishop Machado said, to each other deeply. Archbishop Machado taught me one day in Rome, deep listening is the beginning of healing, he told me. He's my teacher, he calls me Akka, but he's my teacher. I hope you will, yes, yes. I hope you will hear in these words the continuing vision, not just of Gandhiji, but in that sacred line of saints to whom and to which Swami Vivekananda also belonged. Mm -hmm. Shanti Nilava Vendum Ulagi Vendum Atma Shakti Ponga Vendum Ulagili Shanti Nilava Vendum Shanti 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 Thank you, Doctor, for speaking so beautifully about the peace process you witnessed in Nagaland and for addressing the young people about Mahatma Gandhi's symbols of inter-religious inter inter peace, Sarvadharma Prathana, Shramadan, and caring and mentoring. Thank you so much. Um, we, we could now present the mementos to our speakers. I would uh, like to call upon Shri H. B. Dinesh, Treasurer, Karnataka Gandhi Smarakniti, to please come and present the memento to Swamiji. Hello. Call me. Hi. How do you? Hello, dear. Okay. Uh, this is the second one, sir. I'm going to program. 
Durga Bharti Rala. Thank you so much, Dinesh Ji. I would now request uh, Professor Shivraj, Director, Karnataka Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, to please come and present the memento to Archbishop. Thank you, Shivraj, sir. I would request uh, Dr. Abida Begum, Member Karnataka Gandhi Smarak Niti to kindly come over and present the memento to Dr. Kesebi Noaram. is coming, but I would also request Ashutosh and Pravan to thank you. Our last speaker for this session, Sri Raha Naba Kumar from Nokhali, Bangladesh. He is unable to come uh, and be present here in person with us. So he has shared a pre-recorded video of his speech. I would request all our guests on the stage to kindly take your seats, uh, uh, you know, so you can also watch the video with everyone. Chairman of Karnataka Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, Dr. Uday Prithishna Ji, and all other organizers on behalf of Gandhi Ashram Trust of Nuakhali, Bangladesh, I congratulate you all to arrange such an important seminar on Mahatma Gandhi for 21st century, building a global future of peace, justice, fraternity, and sustainable development. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Due to the current situation of Bangladesh, I could not attend the seminar and I am missing you all and missed the opportunity to learn from you. I am not an academician, but I am a practitioner. I work at field level and can share my experiences with you. After a terrible communal riot, Mahatma Gandhi visited Noakhali from 7 November 1946 to 2nd March 1947. His mission was to restore peace and communal harmony among the Hindus and Muslims of the area. 
During Gandhiji's visit, a camp was opened at Ramgon, Jupajala, under present Lakshmipur district, previously which was under Noakhali district, to coordinate Gandhiji's peace work at Noakhali. After leaving Gandhiji from Noakhali for Bihar, the camp was shifted to the present campus of Noakhali, which was donated by Barrister Hemanta Kumar Ghosh to carry out the activities of Gandhi Peace Mission, which was initiated by Mahatma. Presently, Gandhi Ashram Trust is a well-known humanitarian organization in Bangladesh. After partition of India and Pakistan, all the activities of peace mission were closed down due to lack of fund, manpower and security. Maximum Gandhians who came for peace mission activities left Nuakhali after partition and especially after assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. Those who remained at Nuakhali, such as Charu Chauthuri, Vishran Janshen, Reddy Polli, Narayan, Madan Mohan Chattopad and many more were under huge pressure to leave the country. When they refused to do this, they were kept in jail years after year, tried to push out from East Pakistan. All the landed properties of Ashram were forcefully occupied by some local land grabbers with the help of local administration. Other ashrams such as Abhay Ashram, Khadi Pratishthan uh, were burned and smashed to the ground in 1971. During liberation war of Bangladesh, four Gandhians were killed by the Pakistani army with their local collaborators when they were in prayer. After independence of Bangladesh, a law was promulgated by the government and a trustee board was formed and renamed as Gandhi Ashram Trust instead of Ombika Kaliganga Charitable Trust. After the formation of the board, it took a longer time to get the present shape of the organization. From early 80s, Gandhi Ashram Trust started rural development activities. Presently, it is working directly with 1.2 million families of five coastal districts of Bangladesh. More than the last three decades, Gandhi Ashram is working for peace, non-violence, communal harmony through promoting human rights and good governance at a grassroots level with other development programs. It is a very difficult job at the present context of Bangladesh. The Bangladeshi people faced many communal atrocities in many times in various forms, especially the minority community of Bangladesh faced communal violences in 1946, before the partition of India, in 1965, after India-Pakistan war, in 1971, during liberation war of Bangladesh, in 1975, after killing of Bangamadu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, in 1992, after Babri Mosque issue in India, and even before and after every parliament election, the violences took places uh, with ultimately turned Turn, uh, the violences took places and which ultimately turned to the communal violences. It should be mentioned here that during our liberation war in 1971, not only minority community but also millions of uh, millions people of, from Muslim community were killed by the Pakistani army and uh, their local uh, collaborators. The indigenous hilly people are also in threat for so many years. The Christian community, Buddhist community, and other small minority groups faced such atrocities. In every time, it appears to us that all the atrocities were done in the name of politics and religion. Considering all these issues, Gandhi Ashram Trust has taken some initiative for peace, communal harmony, social harmony among the people of different religion and different. Uh, communities. Few of them are year, number one, year-round campaign among the students for different schools, colleges and universities all over Bangladesh. And till to date we have covered more than 1,000 such institutions. Number two, response and support to the victims. Number three, regular meeting, seminar and workshop with the religious leaders of different religions. Number four, we are working with local government institutions 
to promote human rights and good governance. Number five, who are organizing popular theater shows to ever people against any kind of violences. Number six, organizing joint cycle rally with India for peace campaign. Number seven, youth exchange program with different countries. Number eight, organizing international youth peace camp. And last year, 300 youth part participants attended from 18 different countries and exchanged their views on religious harmony and the things what to do next. Uh, number nine, meeting with the policymakers, civil society, think tanks, etc. Number 10, television shows, newspaper articles, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, today's South Asia, as indeed today's world, confronts complex issues. Truth lies fractured. One bit of it here, one bit there. Today's wrongdoer was the wronged one yesterday. In South Africa, for Gandhi, the problem was clear. Racism was wrong. It was evil. Even when he fought the British Raj, the broad issue was clear, but today we have a vast zone of grey. However, Mahatma Gandhi showed us the path. We can remember the seven social sins which are the root cause of all evils. Those are number one, politics without principle, number two, education without character, number three, commerce without morality, number four, science without humanity, number five, uh, wealth without work, number six, pleasure without consent, and number seven, religion without sacrifice. If you want to change the world, we will have to change ourselves. Gandhiji told, be the change you wish to see in the world. Finally, I want to present a quote from our national poet, Kaji Nazrul Islam. He told, he who have the faith on his own religion, who realized the truth of his religion, he can never hate the other's religion. Thank you all for listening to me. Again, thanks to the Karnataka Gandhi Smarak Nidhi. Jai Jagat.